Welcome back to Round Tower Restoration, everybody. My name's Chris. Over there is my 1964 Triumph TR4 that I'm restoring. In my hand here is the lower wishbone for one of the sides of the front suspension, the uh, the front of the back of it. This guy's bent, might not look like it, but obviously can't get these anymore. So we're gonna see if we can straighten this back out so that we can keep original parts on the car. So stick around, we'll see if we can do it. Thanks for watching, let's get it sorted. Here is that front uh, lower wishbone suspension piece that I was talking about. And you can see that the curvature, I think, in there. And uh, reaching out in my favorite form. Now, I say that quite a bit, you know, my favorite form and all that kind of stuff, but I'm not quite sure everybody knows where that is. So I'm going to put a link up in the uh, upper left-hand side of the screen, right-hand side, wherever those things pop up, to uh, the Triumph experience where I get I have had a lot of help throughout my uh, my years of restoration. But anyway, the, uh, the this center hole here, is where the bump stop goes. And they say it's not uncommon that if somebody nails a, nails a bump pretty hard and that bump stop is actuated that it can kind of bend the uh, wishbone arm against that bump stop. So I, uh, I'm gonna take it that that's kind of what happened here. And all I'm gonna do is put it in a press and, and squeeze it right about uh, here and try to uncreate what happened, assuming it was the bump stop thing and see if I can't get lucky and um, not have to get a new one of these. All right, and unfortunately on the uh, dynamics of this, it's pretty much right in the center. So not too, not too tricky of a, uh, a bend here. So we're just gonna essentially set this thing up, get it, uh, get it centered up and bend it the other way. All right, so I've got this top plate here just to kind of spread some of the load and it'll also give me a relatively flat surface, a little bit easier to eyeball. So that's all I'm doing here. I'm just eyeballing it and we'll uh, see if I can't get lucky here. All right, so I got some tension there. Just a nice slow pressure and let it hold for a little bit. Yeah, I think this is gonna work just fine. All right, I'm gonna let that sit for a second, just kind of press. All right, that actually looks halfway decent. Probably get some spring back here. Yeah, it's getting flatter, get straight edge. All right, so that's that's definitely better. The, the problem is, is that the curve, this seems to be straight over here and the bend is down here, which would, I guess, make sense because this is the, the wheel side here and you would have all of your fault, your, you know, your, your bend point would be here and the wheel would be what's jamming up in there. So that would kind of make sense. It goes like this, by the way. So the bump stop is up here. So that would have come up and hit the bump stop and then the wheel would have tried to travel that much further and it would have bent this up even further and you can kind of see that. So I'm nice and straight here, but I'm not so straight here. So probably really I should be touching and bending down more here and using this as my bend point. So I'm not sure. Let me see if I can set the press up that way. It's uh, it's not perfect, but it's you might be able to get a piece of paper through there, essentially this gap right here. So all I did instead of, you know, I pressed from the center at the at the first time and then I noticed, like I showed you, that that one side was a little bit more bent than the other. So all I did was set up like an uneven level here. If you can see on the press, I got this guy here, which is just a little bit shorter than this guy here. So that put it on an angle. And then I favored this side when I pressed and that, that seems to have done it. So that's a, that's a part save there, which is a beautiful thing because you can't get these new. And so I'd be looking for it used, though I'm sure they're out there. But anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's great. So we'll move on to something else. Whole array of suspension parts here, up vertical link, lower wishbone, tie rod lever, upper wishbones, the, uh, the spring plate where the spring goes on the bottom, and all these things have measurements in the workshop manual. Now, if you have some experience with Triumph workshop manuals, you'll find that at times there's some mistakes in there, and uh, it's either just blatantly wrong or they omit information or something like that. And in this case, the TR4, has a couple different designs of these upper links, the upper A-arms, and it has a couple different designs of the tie rod levers and a couple different designs of the trunnions. Now the trunnions are, are properly documented in there. These guys are properly documented in there, but this guy, the tie rod lever is not. They changed the camber of the car from zero degrees to three degrees over the, over the uh, duration of the model run. So that changed obviously some measurements here to achieve that three degree static camber. And one of the things that changes is tie rod lever. So if you look at the TR4 manual in the TR4 section, 
you'll see the old zero degree tie rod lever. You have to go to the TR4A section that brings up that tie rod lever, and I'll show you that here. So this is the workshop manual for the TR4A pages, and you can see down here it's got a uh, the rear swing eye for the uh, rear suspension because it's independent. And then that next page, it's got that spring plate and another lower wishbone because of the independent rear suspension. But if you go several pages before that, you'll find the TR4 information. And you can see that you've got your lower, lower wishbones, your upper, your tie rod levers, your upper wishbones are in here. So that the TR4A measurements, there's, there's some of them are different. Like these are these upper wishbones are exactly the same. I looked at that. But then this tie rod lever over here is different. And so I, what I'm gonna do is check these numbers against what I've got here and see how they come out. And, and the uh, same with the vertical link and all that other stuff. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with taking these measurements. I'll, I will show you a couple things that I did figure out as I, moved, as I went along. Now, my trunnions are shot. The, uh, these areas are all, are all uh, ovaled out and rusted through and pitted and in a really bad shape, so I'm not gonna worry about measuring or doing anything with the trunnions. I already have new ones. But all these measurements, for example, you take the diameter of the bushing here, you take measurements between the center of that guy and this bolt hole, these two bolt holes. Other measurements you take, which I found trickier, are the height off the table. So what I took to doing is grabbing a, just a regular old, you know, cheapo clamp here, getting this thing tightened down as much as I could and go to a relatively flat surface and then measure the vertical distance. You can do that with that. And you can also do it with the lower wishbone here same kind of idea because it gives you vertical distances. Again, I'm not going to go into showing you this. One, it's boring as hell. Two, you may come up with your own way to do it, tracing it out, however you want to do it. But I do, I am going to check these. I'm not going to show you, but I am going to check these because I'm not sure that the TR4A information in the manual matches the TR4 later tie rod levers. They are different part numbers, so I have a feeling these aren't the same. So we'll go ahead, we'll do that real quick, and I'll come right back. All right, so after looking at that tie rod lever, it does not appear that it's the same part. So the measurements are, are a bit different. And like I said, it is different part numbers. Uh, I also think the lower spring pan here is different. I'm not positive. There's a lot of kind of complicated measurements on there that I'm not quite sure I'm getting right. So, but again, based on not seeing any damage and based on the frame being straight, which you'll see here in a little bit and everything else, I'm confident that except for that one tie lower wishbone that I found and, and have since straightened out, I'm confident that these are, are pretty close. So I'm not gonna stress out about taking these measurements. Again, eyeballing everything, looking for like squareness and all that kind of stuff. But otherwise, I'm pretty confident that this stuff is all good. So we're gonna pack all this stuff up. I need to paint everything, but I really wanna do epoxy primer on this stuff instead of rattle can stuff. But I, I don't have the uh, compressed air to be able to do so. But well, like I said, we'll get this stuff away and uh, move on to something else. As you can see, I've got the body on a set of stilts and the, those stilts are bolted to the body at the, the front and the back, so it, it's pretty stable. I did something similar with the Spitfire where it allows me some maneuverability. Also put the body panels on the car to uh, just to get them up and off the floor and, and you know prevent hopefully some incidental damage. And uh, I'll get this covered. You also see that the boot lid there that's not original to the car, obviously. I do have the original one, though it's in pretty sad shape. I got that one when, uh, when I bought the car, though there's Bondo all over that thing too, so who knows what kind of shape that's in. We'll get that covered in a tarp and then move on to the frame. Got the frame on the uh, solid stilts. Got some cedar shakes actually under the back. It's a little bit low in the back. So I try to take care of that and also try to get it level across. So I just, you gotta watch when you're putting that spirit level on there that you're on flat surfaces and that gunk is cleaned up. There's some weld splatter in some spots. You gotta make sure you're, you know, you're level and on a, on a nice clean piece of metal. So now that set's not gonna go anywhere. Now I can start dropping plumb lines at the respective spots and I'll show you in the workshop manual how that points that out. So obviously zoomed in really close on the workshop manual here. There are letters. This is a top view down of the frame. There's letters in here. There's an A right there. You can probably not even really see it. A B right here, C. And as you make your way back, it's A through G. And those are the lines that you drop down and plumb. Make your marks on your ground or on your floor. And then that's the TR4A. When you get to all those things marked up, then you can start triangulating, checking diagonal dimensions, and all that stuff needs to line up with, with the values that are presented in the workshop manual. As long as that does, 
then you think you're good to go. The trick, if you look at some of these spots, that B, that's right in the center of the shock tower. Let me show you that. So here's right in the center of the shock tower. Stick your finger up through there, right? So that's not too bad. Another measuring point, however, is this guy right here off the outrigger. You're supposed to drop straight down through the center of that outrigger. Now, how the heck am I supposed to drop that straight down through the center of that outrigger when there's a big pole in the round, pole in the middle? So I got to figure out how to top properly tie the knot so that I can make that work. But uh, but there's my plumb over there. So we're gonna go drop a couple, see if I can uh, figure out how to make this work, and see what we can't come up with. So here's a couple pages later in the workshop manual. And when you drop those plumb lines, you line up with all these letters. And it tells you to make this grid on the floor. Now, I don't, I don't really see a reason for making the grid on the floor and finding the center line, but I guess you can measure halfway. But what then you do, once you do that, then you're measuring and you're just taking lengths from like point A here to point C here, point A here to point C here. And they have to be equal. It doesn't give you values. It just tells you that they should be, you know, the opposing pair should be equal. So the two A's, A to C should be equal. The two B to C should be equal. D to G, right? The ones that they have that are lined up here. So here you can see I've got this ruler set up. And, who, you know, just obviously not incredibly accurate, but accurate enough. So I got it way over there. The end of it is on the A line, the A drop on the passenger side, all the way over here to the C line on the driver's side and looking at that X right there, which you can see I'm right at 59 inches. So now I'm gonna do that same thing except on the opposite side and see what I get. So to show you a close up here, here's the A point and you can see I've got the silver tab right in the center of the ruler, right on the center of the X that I made. And then I'll show you where we are on the other end. And then you can see here they've got the X right there and believe it or not, that's 59 inches. Now, who knows if that's luck or if this thing is actually working for me, but what I'm gonna do now is take another measurement and oppose each other and see what I get for those. Next up, we got the B to C and the X is right there. I don't know how well you can see it, but we're looking at uh, just a little bit over 52 inches. It looks like 52, one, two, three, four, 52 and a quarter. So now we'll go to B to C on the other side and see if I get 52 and a quarter. All right, so you can just barely see that X. And now we're looking at, instead of 52 and a quarter, we're looking at maybe 52 and three eighths, I would say. So to me, that's good enough. And, you know, with my one to two tenths off from moving the X and that stuff like that, I'm going to call this good. So I'll go ahead and I'll measure the rest of the, rest of the cross pieces and, and compare them up and everything like that. I think this is more of a gross, dress, gross trek, especially the way that I'm doing it. So, you know, if I look at a half an inch off, you know, quarter and a half an inch, then I might start getting nervous. But as long as you're consistent, like, like I'd showed you where you put the, you know, the center of the tape and the, the tab right at the one X and, and measure on the same side, I think as long as you're consistent, the absolute values don't really matter. It's that they're equal from side to side in all the ways that, that the workshop manual calls out that it should be. So. I'm uh, going to go ahead from there. Like I said, I'll, I'll go ahead and do the rest of the measurements. I'll come back and tell you what the results are. Well, believe it or not, everything came out fine. I'm not quite sure if I'm more surprised that I was able to figure out how to do it and it made sense and it worked and double checking it worked or if the thing is actually straight. Probably more surprised that I could figure it out, to tell you the truth, uh, in the absence of any obvious, obvious accident damage like I mentioned. There's still a bunch of checks you can do, like 75, 77 checks the workshop manual has. It goes from like this bolt hole to this bolt hole and all that kind of stuff. I'll do that. I didn't do that on this video. I won't. I probably won't show you that at all just because it's, it's simple measurements, but I don't really have any uh, any fear that any of those are going to be off. So that's, uh, that's how I check my suspension parts and the frame and, and everything seems to have worked out except for that one piece that I straightened back out. So I'm happy. We'll continue on refurbishing all this stuff. And, uh, and using all of it as it came with the car. So that's all I got. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers.